right, so today is going to be all about ornamental fish culture and to introduce you to that segment of the Florida aquaculture industry, we've got Eric Cassiano. So Eric should not be new to you. You might remember him. He um, actually worked here uh, several times, actually. First as a technician, yeah. and uh, then he went on back to school at UF and got his master's degree in aquaculture and fisheries, I guess. Right. Came back to Syracuse to work as a biological scientist until he was snagged by the Tropical Aquaculture Lab down in Ruskin to work there in the ornamental and tropical fish industry. And he currently is the aquaculture extension specialist for the lab there. So we couldn't have a better person to introduce you to ornamental fish. So he's actually going to give the presentation and then show you some videos from the farm. Okay, thanks. Um, let me make sure. Okay, ornamental fish culture. So this is, oh good, it worked. Excellent. Um, so this is a mended from uh, Charlie Culpepper, who works at FDAX, but it's uh, got a lot of good pictures and um, uh, a pretty good topic. There we go. All right, cool. So or ornamental fish, ornamental fish really basically are pretty fish that we look at in fish tanks. Um, you can eat them if you want. Uh, they're, some of them are not going to fill you up. Some of them might, I guess. The carps are, are, are pretty big from time to time. But anyway, so we grow them for aesthetic reasons. We grow them, grow them to look at, whether it's either for fish tanks or ponds. And Florida's pretty good at it. I'm going to get into some numbers here in a second. But, um, hold on. Oh, there we go. Oh, all right. Boom. Okay, so where do aquarium fish come from? Um, Charlie's used a clownfish as an example here, but... Um, ornamental fish, aquarium fish, if you have a fish tank, those are ornamental fish. Um, a, a lot of them are collected from the wild um, and more so and increasingly more are, are grown on, on farms. So uh, we call those ones that are collected from the farms, we call that a fishery. Um, and the ones that are aquacultured, uh, uh, those are the ones that are grown on farms. And so uh, those distinctions are going to be important moving forward, especially when we talk about imports and exports. Um, I'm moving through these first initial slides kind of quick, but uh, it's really just to get some basic points across and then we'll talk about some uh, some meatier stuff here in a minute. So anyway, um, most of the ornamental fish in Florida are uh, that are aquacultured are freshwater. Uh, that's 95% of that ornamental industry is freshwater fish. And you'll see some pictures here in a second, but um, when we look at freshwater fish, this is the whole world now. This isn't just Florida. Uh, most of those are aquaculture. Um, very few are wild captured or fishery. Um, I don't really like to use the word sustainable. Um, it, could be, it could be misleading, but you know, aquacultured source, it's a farm product, it's an agriculture product. The wild capture source is a natural resource. It's a, it's a wild fish that's been captured from, the, uh, for, from its natural environment. So in the freshwater world, when you think about freshwater ornamental fish, or you go to Petco or PetSmart or wherever you buy your fish from, if you do buy fish, um, a lot of those freshwater fish have been aquacultured. On the saltwater side of things, it's really the inverse. It's total opposite. Um, most of those saltwater fish are from wild capture sources. Uh, if they're Indonesian, then it's a lot of net penning, a lot of, uh, uh, you, you, oftentimes you'll, you'll, you'll hear this in the news about cyanide sprays being used. Some of those are used from time to time. A lot of it is uh, uh, netting and going down literally with a scuba gear and capturing this fish. But the important takeaway here is, is the increase. So on the freshwater side, we have 90% aquaculture. On the saltwater side, it's more like 90% wild capture, uh, but that's growing. When we started back in 2009 looking at saltwater fish pretty intensively here at the lab, uh, Seagrass Farms, one of the major wholesalers, uh, they were of their aquaculture, I mean, of their saltwater fish, 5% uh, were aquaculture. And now that's come up to about 11 to 12% being aquaculture. So that's a pretty big increase in a short period of time. Now, a lot of that is due to consumer awareness, um, this sort of accountability. Um, you know, where are our fish coming from? People want to know that with food, but they also want to know that 
with their own aquarium fish too. People that keep aquarium fish um, can be sometimes fanatical about it. And so they want to know where it came from, where it was hatched, where what it ate when it was a baby. And, and, and that's a great thing uh, for some of our producers because they're really making a living on that increased accountability, increased consumer awareness. And we see in that really in both freshwater and saltwater, but really a lot of saltwater. Now it's also a reflection of the fact that there are a lot more saltwater fish being produced. We have about uh, a little less than a hundred total ornamental fish producers in the state of Florida and maybe 15 of those do saltwater fish. So it's, it's not a big footprint, but that's growing and they are growing as a group. All right, what's next here? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, for this example, it, it's kind of funny. There's a guy in Lakeland, his name's Ray, Ray Quillen, and his daughter, Brittany, um, they run urban tropical fish farms and they specialize in fresh, freshwater angelfish. Um, and it, it's always, a, and they have really kind of cornered the market on it. I mean, there's other farmers that do it, but they, they do a lot of them. And so I always say, tell people, if you buy an angelfish anywhere in the United States, it more than likely came from, came from Ray's farm. And that's pretty cool. You know, and, and people like that sort of uh, making it personal and, and, and putting it down on, uh, on a real life, real time level. And you guys know this too. I mean, obviously, um, you know, you're from Cedar Key. I mean, this video is being recorded for everybody, but uh, the kids here are from Cedar Key and, and those clams that are grown in Cedar Key are sold all throughout the United States and, and even beyond. So and that's something to be, to be proud of, you know. Um, so I would say, you know, if you see an angel fish in Chicago, it more than likely came from uh, urban tropical fish farms. And that's something to be extremely proud of as a Floridian, but as someone that's into aquaculture as well. Yes, imports. So imports are really vitally important. And uh, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit here. Um, when you think about imports, those imports can also be an aquaculture source. Um, I'm going to really focus on the ones from Southeast Asia. If you look at this graph here, and this is put together by Charlie, um, you see these small percentages for South Pacific and Central America and Africa. And those grow and those change from time to time in Africa and Europe. But primarily it's that Southeast Asia and those imports that are coming from Southeast Asia. And that's really the big competitor for our Florida farmers. I always think of the live bears and you guys are probably like, what's a live bear? So a live bear was, uh, it's a type of fish that, that gives birth to live babies, uh, just like us. Of course, they're fish that. Um, so they don't lay eggs. Uh, mollies, uh, platies, swordtails, these are live bears. And the industry here in Florida was really founded on that type of a fish. And you'll see in the next few slides, it's... Uh, in the third or fourth slide here, um, talk a little bit more about live bears. But anyway, uh, the industry in Florida was really sort of based on that. And nowadays you can't find this. There may be one guy doing live bears, maybe two. There's another guy that's really starting to do it. Uh, and the reason is cost. It's cheaper to do them overseas and to ship them back over here. So, or, or to ship there to import them. And that's kind of sad. Obviously they started um, here in Florida and, now a lot of that production is done overseas and a lot of that's labor cheap labor overseas uh, makes uh, the cost of producing some of those fish species more lucrative but florida so florida is um when it comes to ornamental fish um i mean that's it as far as the united states is concerned uh you know, florida produces a, a high amount of ornamental fish for the united states um, oh, there it is right there, the third bullet. 95% of the ornamentals produced in the U.S. come from Florida. I mean, it's pretty much it. There is some production in Arkansas as well, um, in Hawaii. The Arkansas production is uh, mostly goldfish and shiners. A lot of that's for bait that can be sold into the ornamental industry. And so, uh, so Charlie's put why Florida here. Um, it's really an ideal climate. Obviously, um, you guys are from Florida. You know, it gets hot doesn't get as hot as it does in Southeast Asia, but it does get hot enough here to grow fish. Um, what I've added there on that map, if you look uh, in that bottom corner there, is that red line, that freeze line. And I've lived throughout Florida 
in some spots and that is so true it is it is much hotter down here and even in south florida um than it is up at the panhandle and you guys probably know that traveling around um, a lot of those farms are below that freeze line and it's because these fish that we grow here are typically not from around here um, they're from southeast asia they're from africa they're from uh, um, Central America, South America. And so they're really used to a much warmer climate. And so we have to grow them typically extensively. You'll see some ponds here in a little bit. Um, and in their environment where they can thrive. If it gets too cold, even these, this past winter, we had a couple of cold snaps come through in January. And some of the farmers, if they didn't cover their ponds with plastic, uh, they lost their whole pond of Central American cichlids. And so it does happen. Um, we had two different events this past January. One was a, it was really cold for a short period of time. Um, and then we had another one where it was yeah, kind of cold, cold enough um, for a longer period of time, but we had a lot of cloud cover and that was the more damaging one. Um, so yeah, they definitely lose the fish. Uh, these fish are not from around here. They like that warmer climate. That freeze line sort of dictates where all these farms are. And, and most of the farms are in Hillsborough County, which is where we're at. Uh, we're in Ruskin, which is just south of Tampa, which is in Hillsborough. Uh, Polk County is right beside us. And then Miami-Dade. Um, and a lot of that too is from that live bearer um, <clears throat> infrastructure where they've dug out these ponds and you know that's costly. So the ponds are already dug out. And so a lot of the guys even though they're not doing live bears anymore, uh, uh, have that local infrastructure and, and the farms are already established. And so they're able to um, use those. And here's some of the species that, that we grow. Now these are not all of them by any means. Um, I would say about 10 years ago, it was up to about 800 different species. Now it says, okay, so under minnows, it says over 2000 species. We, we don't have that many species in production. Uh, we probably have right now about 400, 500 different varieties and species of ornamental fish. It fluctuates. It, it used to be much higher, up around 800, something like that, which is really fascinating. And so, you know, these are some of the groups that Charlie's uh, um, dichotomized out here. I have minnows, tetras, armor, catfish, and there's another slide here too. Uh, sucker mouth catfish, rainbow fish, cichlids. Um, <clears throat> it's really interesting and that's kind of indicative of Florida aquaculture in general when you think about it. Uh, take for instance any, any food fish industry, catfish industry, tilapia, whatever it is, um, they're growing one maybe two different types of species. You know even with oysters you're growing many different types of species but you know it's not 400 and so we're really good at, at growing different types of fish and learning about how to grow different types of fish. Um, we have people come study simply because of that from a health issue um, here at the lab, which I'll explain when we do the tour thing. Um, but that's really the, the hallmark of Florida aquaculture is its diversity, not just within ornamental fish, but if you think about ornamental plants, and I'm sure Brandon and Pierre went over this, um, yeah, <laughs> the, the varieties and types of plants that are grown are enormous. And, uh, and then you add you know, clams, alligators, corals onto that, and then uh, even, you know, FDAX has an all other category that is quite large. So Florida aquaculture is really, you know, the huge takeaway there is the diversity that happens within it. So what we're going to talk about, some egg layers, some live bears, and some, some marine species. This is how we break it up um, when we try to evaluate what's going on within the state, um, just so we can put everything in, in boxes and count, count fish in numbers. So egg layers, even though um, a lot of what you're gonna see is, is called live bear culture, not live bears really don't, hold on one second. Um, there it is, okay. Um, so the live bears, we really don't do a lot of those anymore. Um, we do a lot of egg layers and egg layers are, um, could be anywhere from throwing a sponge in a tank and you'll see this, it's on one of my videos. Actually, can we play a video? Is that possible, Natalie, or no? Yeah, um, I'm gonna... Or, or, or do you wanna wait? Here. Oh, it has to be at the end? I, I put them all at the end of the PowerPoint. Oh, it's okay then, don't worry. Well, don't worry about it. Is it one of these, though? 
Yeah, I want to. So go to the last one. There we go. No, oh, sorry, the third one. Sorry. Okay, so this is a video. This is a native species, and we'll talk about them again. Oh, it's kind of grainy. That's not cool. But anyway, um, so you see the different substrate. In these, these tanks, like that first tank had um, rocks and pebbles in it and stuff like that. And the second tank has this sort of grassy stuff. And then this other one has, has a sponge. Yeah, you can let it cycle again if it'll, if it'll do it. Um, so this is the black banded sunfish. And we'll come back and look at this video again. But um, but these are egg layers. And so what they're gonna do is we're, we're testing out different ways for them to lay eggs. So the, do they like these grass? Do they like a rocky bed? Or are they gonna have this sponge? And the last tank, which we're gonna see here, I mean, uh, we call it, it's not a sponge, it's a, um, a brush. It's like a needle brush. It's like, a, it's literally a cleaner brush that you would use to clean pipes and stuff. And those are pretty heavily used in the industry. So a lot of these fish, sorry, can, can I have control now? Yes, we'll go all the way back. <laughs> so a lot of these fish, like I said, we have 400 different varieties and a lot of them are egg layers. And so we want to know, um, yeah, that's cool. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I don't ever, I don't ever adhere to rules. Um, so anyway, um, we're doing it. So the egg layers, um, some of them actually literally will broadcast their eggs on the bottom. Some of them will lay them into almost a floating mat of, of, of reeds and weeds. And, and some of them will uh, uh, disperse them onto a, a sponge. Now we want to be able, our sponge, a brush, sorry, keep calling it a sponge. Now we want to be able to get those eggs out and of course hatch them. Um, uh, you know, there's even more. I mean, there's bubble nesters. The garamis are bubble nesters, so they'll build a bubble nest and they'll put their eggs into the bubble nest. So there's a lot of different varieties within that one single egg layer variety. And we want to figure out what's going to be the best way to do that culture and grow that fish. And so the egg layers, once once we, uh, okay, he's used cichlids as his, as his example. Cichlids are pretty interesting. A lot of them are mouth brooders. Uh, they'll hold them in their mouths. Um, now what they want to do is come out and shake out those eggs and, or they'll keep them in and let them hatch and, and, and grow. But usually you'll shake out the eggs and then they'll reload the eggs some more. Um, this is pretty interesting. So, and we'll talk about ponds in a second. Those are where the, the, the fry of those fish go. Um, this is pretty industry wide here, the use of these burial vaults. So those are actually burial vaults that uh, the state of Florida uses the coffin goes inside of those and then they go into the ground. We use them for fish tanks. Uh, we get them used. So usually at a farm, you'll see a big pile of bones in the back. That's okay. All right. That's somebody got it. I heard somebody chuckle a little bit. All right. Um, that's not true. We don't get them used. I tell third graders that and they get all grossed out and start running. But anyway, um, but they're, they're cheap. Uh, they're heavy. Uh, so when you put them down, that's where they stay typically, uh, but they are cheap. They are used. Uh, these are not gel coated, but we gel coat ours. Um, I've seen some that have been used for 50 years as a fish tank. And that's why they use them. They're durable. They're sturdy. They're cheap. Uh, you can have holes drilled in them. But if you go to a fish farm without fail, you will see rows and rows and rows of burial vaults. And that's what they're growing those fish in. Now, Charlie's used cichlids here as an example, but, um, you know, it could be tetras, it could be uh, red-tailed black shark. Um, you know, it could be any of those varieties. Here we have some pictures of those cichlids as mouth brooders. And like I said, you know, there's a, a lot of diversity within that egg layer community. And that's typically what's grown here now is a lot of these egg layers and a lot of cichlids. So Florida does a lot of cichlids. Uh, there are a lot of cichlid farmers. Um, our water is conducive to that. They're big sellers. They get a lot per unit fish. There's Central American, African, and South American cichlids. They're very beautiful. Um, and a lot of people that like to keep, uh, they're kind of a niche thing. Well, not a niche thing, but they're, they're usually kept within themselves. Um, so a lot of people like to keep uh, colorful, beautiful saltwater fish, keep cichlids as well, um, even though they're freshwater. Uh, a little bit easier to maintain a freshwater system, but they have these big, 
vibrant colors. They're big, they're aggressive fish. Um, they're very beautiful and there's a lot of them. Uh, we have a, a bunch of different varieties within those African, Central American and South American um, types. So induced spawning. So <clears throat> I actually added the slide completely um, because it's important to know. So we have, so like I said, we deal with a lot of egg layers now um, versus those live bears. Um, but I'm still going to show you some of the ponds in that infrastructure in a second. But induced spawning is pretty important. Now, we typically don't do this with some of the species, but some of them, when we're trying to learn how to get them to spawn, um, this is how we start. So uh, we will cannulate the fish, and this is koi here, we're using this as an example, and koi are a, a great fish to in, induce spawn with, but uh, we'll check the, the eggs. If you look up in the top right corner, you'll see uh, our director, Mr. Craig Watson, he's taking a little plastic tube, and he's inserting that into the urogenital opening of the female, and he's literally, with the suction within his mouth, sucking out the eggs. Now, he's not eating them. <laughs> he's going to take a little bit into that tube and then he's going to reverse that suction and, and, and blow some of them out onto a slide. And then we're gonna look at them under the microscope and that's what that middle picture in the top is, is those are the eggs that are under the microscope that we're looking at. We're looking for that little white dot in the center called the macronucleus that has migrated to the side and that tells us that those fish are ready to be injected. When that macronucleus migrates, that's the female getting ready to ovulate, getting ready to drop her eggs and, and ready for, um, um, for those eggs to be fertilized. Oftentimes, there'll be some sort of environmental cue that we either don't know about or can't replicate in order to get them to do that at the same time. A lot of these fish, again, remember, come from South America and regions where there's a lot of rainy season comes and it tells them to spawn. Um, change in conductivity, some sort of subtle change or big change in the water quality will say, all right, it's time to spawn. So we forego that for cost reasons, typically, or lack of knowledge, really. And we'll inject the fish with uh, a hormone that tells the female to release the eggs. It acts uh, uh, on their uh, uh, pituitary, usually and the male to uh, release the milt or the sperm. Um, it's really more important for the female, so we typically focus on that aspect of it, but uh, we also inject the males as well to get them to um, release. Now you can always, at that point, you could either put them together, a male and a female in a tank together, and they'll spawn, or you can onto a brush or, or the rock bottom or, or one of those, uh, pseudo seagrass of uh, palm palms if you will or you can strip spawn them which is what is going on in that uh, middle picture in the bottom so sorry on the bottom on the on the left you can see the needle going into the fish it's usually an intermuscular injection and that's a koi being injected with um, hormone over prim typically and then we're uh, strip spawning the eggs out of the koi there i don't think that's a koi that's something else but uh, strip spawning those eggs into a bowl uh, and then we'll put the milt or sperm into a bowl with the eggs, add a little bit of water, that'll activate the sperm to fertilize the eggs, and then we'll take the eggs and put them into a some sort of a tumbler or a McDonald jar, which is what you have on the bottom right there. Um, and those eggs are constantly tumbled. They're negatively buoyant, so uh, they, want, they want to sink, and we're pumping a little bit of water to the bottom to keep them up and tumbling. And then they'll hatch into little babies. Pretty cool. Um, so here it says live bearer culture techniques, but we're actually going to uh, put our egg layers out into here. But um, this is the infrastructure. The, these are what fish farms look like. And I know Natalie has a video. It's okay. We'll just wait till the end to, to, to look at it. Um, but these are what fish farms look like. Like I said, there's, you know, about a hundred throughout the state um, and rows and rows and rows and rows of ponds. Now in Florida, um, these ponds are, are, are pretty small. Um, you'll see, Hold on. Well, I'll show you in a minute how small they are. But anyway, um, they're pretty tiny. Um, we'll put, you know, any uh, roughly 10,000, depends on the type of fish it is, but we'll put about 10,000 babies out in that pond. Um, the pond is going to bloom up naturally with 
phytoplankton and zooplankton. Uh, algae and bugs are going to bloom up, and that's just great food for little fish that have just hatched, and they love it. Um, you can hold them for a little bit, depends on the species you want. Maybe you want to hold them, maybe you want to feed them some artemia, which is the sea monkeys or brine shrimp. Um, get them a little bit bigger and then put them in the pond, or maybe you want to put them directly in the pond. Again, it depends on the species and it depends on the farmer. Uh, depends on the technique. Some guys do it. Everyone does it their own way, kind of a little bit differently. But um, those fry are going to end up out in that pond, um, and that's where they're going to spend you know, two, three, four months growing, eating that that productivity, especially when they're younger, eating all those bugs. And then, of course, you're going to feed them as well. Um, uh, pellets, dusts, which is literally like a dust of um, of food fish or uh, uh, fish food, sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and they're going to grow up big. And then uh, when it's time, you're going to, you know, do it at the right time for the right species, whether it's winter time or summertime. And then when it's time, you're going to go in and get them. Right. So yeah, and we have to have aeration for it. I know it's kind of hard to see how big this pond is. It's, it's, it's a little bigger than it would normally be, but um, these ponds are not big. They're pretty tiny. I have one of a picture of somebody saying in one in a second. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, so it gives you a relative size there, but anyway, so you have to supply some aeration, not only to keep the DO level up. I mean, again, we're putting, and it depends on the farmer, but you can put uh, 8,000, 10,000, 15,000 fish in a pond like this. You're going to need to keep the oxygen level up. And not only that, but it helps to mix the water too. These ponds can be about six to eight feet deep. So they can get stratified, which is warmer water on top, colder water on the bottom, or vice versa. Um, but you want that good mixing. You want it pretty evenly uh, uh, uniform throughout the pond. And so we put some aeration in here. You're also going to see uh, uh, one, one of the other aeration techniques in the video at the end as well um, that uh, my predecessor has uh, instituted in, in some locations. But. Yeah. Oh yeah, birds. So, um, oh yeah, and there you see one of the farmers feeding the pond there. So it gives you an idea what these look like. So yeah, birds are a huge, um, huge problem. Um, the, the book on depredation of birds is, is pretty thick. Um, they're probably the number one nuisance. Birds and turtles would be uh, an issue for, for a lot of these uh, fish farmers to have to deal with. Um, come on. Oh, buddy, there you go. Um, so how a lot of those guys deal with them are these metal frames and you'll see it in the video at the end too as well we have our, our metal frames over there and then you can kind of see if you look closely on that metal frame um, some bird netting and so and you see the one on the right there um, where the farmers actually feeding it he has plastic that's that's literally the plastic that you would have on a greenhouse um, so these are some covers for some of the ponds now the bird netting obviously is to keep the birds out now birds are pretty they're pretty, uh, they're pretty smart, so they know how to get in there, and they'll find their way in and still make a living eating some of those fish, and, and that just happens. Um, on the right, you see the plastic on the farm, on the, on the pond, I mean, on that frame, and so uh, that's, used, that's just like a greenhouse. So during the winter when I was talking about those freezes coming through, uh, that plastic is going to heat up your pond a good 10 degrees warmer than it would be, and that's the difference in life and death a lot of times. Uh, through the winter for some of these species that are grown, especially uh, the cichlids. Say it again. How bad was this past winter? Um, you know, it wasn't too bad. A lot of the guys, uh, so that's a good question. Um, it, it depends on the guy. <laughs> I had, there was a, a, a guy down the road that I told him, I was like, hey, you know, there's a pretty good freeze coming. And it's one of those longer freezes where it's not as cold, um, but if you don't cover your pond, you're going to lose your fish. And he did not, and he lost a whole pond of Central American cichlids. And that's quite a bit of money. I mean, you're talking you know, tens of thousands of dollars there, uh, potentially, and that's breeders that aren't going to breed. Um, the smarter ones are uh, better at it but uh it was a pretty big hit actually and, and simply because we had two different types um we had that short really cold freeze uh which dropped the water down universally everywhere and then we had that really long 
didn't really freeze, but it was cold and it was cloudy. There wasn't a lot of mixing and that seemed to be detrimental at the end. But um, this is something that they've had to deal with routinely. And so, uh, um, you know, and to get a number from a guy, of course, he has a farmer and go, it's the end of the world. But uh, um, they were pretty heavily hit, yeah. Uh, and it happens every year. The, the, this year it happened to be sort of one of those double whammies where we had that. I don't know if you guys were hit pretty hard or not, but uh, um, I think it was like 20, which is unheard of down here. Um, so here we have some of the traps. Sorry, I'm going back. Here we have some of the traps. Uh, these are, so how would we get our fish out of that pond, right? Uh, we got to sell them. They've been growing in there forever. Um, so here's a trap. You guys have another one? You'd think I would know, right? There it is. Okay, nope. Um, can they see me, Natalie? Yeah. All right, I'm gonna grab something. Okay. <laughs> All right. Can you guys see me? Yeah. All right. Can you see this? Yeah. All right. This is what's typically used as a trap. And if you've caught crayfish or crawdads or whatever, um, then you've seen something very similar to this. Um, we have the other one where it's the plastic. Uh, um, and those are for some more delicate species, uh, but these are used quite a lot. And you can see they they open up on the side here. Um, this fish swims in. You put some bait in here or whatever food, and the fish swims in, and it can't swim out. And that's pretty much it. Now those are for smaller orders um, and ponds that you don't want to you don't want to completely harvest from. And then of course the other option is. Uh, um, saning it. And this gives you an idea how big these ponds are. They're really not super big. Um, <clears throat> you can see these two gentlemen, a sane net has weights on one on, on the bottom and floats on the top. And one guy is going to grab one end of it. The other guy is going to grab the other end of it. And they're going to start on one end of the pond and go completely to the other side with the theory that those weights are going to drag along the bottom floats are going to stay on the top and you're going to get a lot of those fish in that first pool uh, going through. Um, a lot of times what you'll do is you'll draw the pond down too. If you have a, a bigger pump, like I said, these ponds are six to eight feet deep. If you can draw three foot of water out of there, there's just, and then just have to deal with three feet. Um, then that's a, a lot easier to manage as well. And so, and once they sane them, they'll, uh, let's see what Charlie's got here. Oh, nope. All right. So once they sane them, they'll, um, uh, They'll, they'll, they'll be a, uh oh, there'll be a person on the side of the pond with a, uh, with a bin or something, and they'll take those fish out and they'll put them in a bin and they'll take them back to their, to, to the, uh, to, to the greenhouse or to the, the building. Well, they'll, they'll put them in some of those burial vaults for processing, right? Um, these bigger fish tanks. And you'll have someone come through and grade them. And so grading fish is, <clears throat> Is everybody okay on that end? Yeah, I think something <laughs> on awry. Let me try and get this fixed. You, you can blame me. It's cool. No, it's it's not you. Darn. Um, so they'll grade them. And a lot of times, I mean, they'll size grade them, but a lot of it, you know, again, think about it. Um, this isn't a fish that you're going to eat. This is a fish that's going to end up in a pretty fish tank. And people want to look at it. And so they're going to grade it by color and by the, the appearance of the fins and things like that. And so, uh, um, oh yeah, there you go. Great about size, but also appearance. And then they're going to be boxed up. I think there's another. Oh, do I have control or not? Uh, no, here we go. Commercial fish grader. There you go. So, you know, a lot of these, the, the, the mom and pops will be, uh, okay, thanks. 
a lot of the mom and pops will be literally a person doing the grading. And then of course there's commercial graders, as you can see on the side, as, as the bigger they get. And of course they want to make it as efficient as possible. Um, you'd be amazed though. There's a lot of fish that are going in and out of uh, Florida. That's a pretty typical midsize. You go to Seagrist or, or 5D, it's a, it's, it's, it's a lot of fish, a lot of fish boxes, a lot of consolidating of fish in two boxes. Um, they always say that, uh, I said, so, okay, Charlie put tropical fish are the number one air cargo item passing through Tampa International Airport. That's not always true. Um, number one and number two flip flop, at least that's the, the joke, the running joke is uh, um, it's either, uh, well, dead bodies or tropical fish that, that are underneath you. Um, of course, a lot of people come to Florida to retire and when they pass away, they um, have to want to go back home to Ohio or wherever to be buried. And so um, that's sort of the running joke that we always say is uh, you're flying out of Tampa International Airport, you're either on top of fish or deceased individuals or both. But those are number one and number two. And that's, that's, not, that's, that's the truth. At least that's what I've been told. <laughs> Anyway, let's see here. What's next? It's not moving. Okay. Oh, there we go. Oh yeah, marine stuff. So, you know, marine fish are, um, thank you. Uh, marine fish are pretty interesting. Uh, like I said, it's a really a, a, a growing sector of the ornamental fish industry. Um, it's still, um, not, not as large as the freshwater fish industry, uh, uh, as far as aquaculture production within the state of Florida is concerned. Um, it is primarily clownfish and dotty backs, uh, that are grown, but there's a lot of other species too. I mean, seahorses are there. Uh, absolutely. There's blennies, there's gobies, um, there's uh, yeah, shrimp too, as well. Um, it's a pretty interesting sector. Um, and like I said, it is growing. I kind of went over that in the beginning. Um, it's popular. It's super popular. It's, it, and I often say it's apples and oranges, really, when it comes to the hobbyist level. Um, you know, keep in mind who you're selling your product to. For the freshwater fish, it's a lot of, oh, hey, let's set up a fish tank for my kid that wants to see a fish swim around. And this is a fun summertime project for me to do. Uh, the marine guys tend to be a step up and and really into it and i don't want to say fanatical but definitely are are good aquarium keepers it is apples and oranges so um so when it comes to um keeping these marine critters um uh it's a step up um here's a little bit about the uh, clownfish uh, they are an egg layer, a little bit about the clownfish uh, reproductive cycle here. They are an egg layer and they literally use flower pots. This is pretty common. Like uh, I showed you some of the, uh, the rock bottom and the, and the fake pom pom grass and the brushes for the uh, black banded sunfish. Um, and a lot of the flower pots are used for some of these sticky adhesive eggs. This is the freshwater world, but this is also in the saltwater world as well. So, um, and they are uh, a lot of maternal care when it comes to clownfish. So they'll lay, they'll lay their eggs on a tile typically, or they'll use a flower pot, hatch those out, um, and then the, the larvae are, are grown into tanks. All the, all the marine culture is in tanks, and they really don't use uh, the burial vault technology as much as they do in the freshwater world. A lot of these are your circular fiberglass tanks, and yes, aquariums. Uh, typically, what they'll house their clownfish in and the dotty backs, uh, that's the same adhesive egg onto a tile technology um, are in 10 gallon aquariums. So you'll go into a farm and you'll see rows and rows and rows of 10 gallon aquariums with paired off clownfish. Uh, clownfish are pretty unique. They're kind of, uh, they are monogamous. Um, and they take a little while to uh, get to know each other. So when you set up your clownfish, it takes a little bit of time to get them to start breeding. Uh, we typically don't do induced spawning um, uh, on some of these fish. I'm, I'm more of the, uh, like the pinfish, pompano, things like that. That's where we would do um, induced spawning. Corals. So corals are pretty interesting. Um, I started down here, like, like Leslie said, I started down here in 2010. Um, corals at that time were a lot of uh, fragging, which would be, I think he actually goes into it. Yeah, so you would take your parent coral and then you would 
literally break off pieces and either adhere them to some sort of a substrate, use some sort of a pedestal, uh, to, oftentimes with glue, um, and let them grow. And so this is really not a sexual reproduction typical of aquaculture. This is asexual reproduction. You're literally breaking a piece of coral and letting it grow and selling that. And a lot of these were done in the basements and garages of um, hobbyists. Um, and it was hard for FDAX to keep track of it. It's since, oh, and they would trade too. That was the other thing. So I'll trade you a frag for, you know, a, a protein skimmer, it's a, which is a part of a biofilter. And so, um, you know, a lot of these, uh, it, it's become more and more um, bought and sold for money. So it's, it, it's, it's getting easier for us to quantify what this footprint actually is. Um, but yeah, extremely popular, especially those Indo-Pacific corals. Um, a lot of the stony corals that we deal with uh, here, well, these are all Indo-Pacific, but uh, as far as the Keys corals are concerned, they are looking at, um, at the Center for Conservation. Uh, Josh Patterson's looking at uh, a sexual reproduction and fragging of uh, those stony corals that are needed for stock enhancement in the Keys. And that's extremely important if you've ever been down the Keys. It's big loss of that staghorn coral down there. And so, um, so there is a stock enhancement effort as well as um, ornamental effort. Oh, there's the hard corals, sorry. All right. Oh, and live rock. Yeah, live rock is just uh, exactly what it says it is, where um, you take a piece of porous rock and really just let it sit in the sump of your marine tank and get all these bugs and bacteria and and algae all on it and then you uh, yeah it even shows it there yeah you have your base rock where it's just nothing on it and then all this stuff grows on it and then you sell that and that's a pretty big business as far as uh, um, ornamental marine ornamental aquaculture is concerned so yeah uh, the two big biggest takeaways are that florida is the largest ornamental producer in the united states i don't like to use the word sustainable but Ornamental aquaculture helps to uh, uh, maintain those wild populations and, of course, provides a, a lucrative business for our aquaculture producers. I think that's it. All right. Any questions? So, so I wanted to say one thing because I, I purposely didn't go over any of the recirculating stuff or systems design. Cause I know that, uh, um, what's his name? Brian, Brian did in the beginning, correct? Yes, he did. Yeah. Brian so, did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I purposely didn't do that, but I will say this, a lot of obviously the Marine ornamental world is heavily intensive or recirculating. And it has to be, we can't discharge salt water. So it, we have to recapture and reuse a lot of that water. In the freshwater world, um, it's, it's moving in that direction. But if you have a good well, a lot of these guys pump their water from a well, 100, 200, 250 feet. And they'll cure that water through a degasser because it has CO2 and hydrogen sulfide in it and maybe ammonia and so they may have to run it through a biofilter a little bit and then they'll flow that to their vats those burial vaults that i was talking about and it'll flow right through there and it'll go back to their detention pond so it's semi-intensive semi-extensive depends on how you want to look at it um, but there is some water treatment typically done but it's not a complete recirculating system uh, that was probably presented to you by by brian so and everywhere in between <laughs> um, as if you guys, you know, you grew up in a clam farming town there, so you know how creative farmers can be when it comes to solving their problems. So, and we see that in the ornamental fish world too. Um, there's guys that are fully intensive recirculating systems and there's guys that flow directly from their well and don't do anything to their water and everywhere in between. So, so is there any questions? Well, I'll tell you, you haven't shown the videos yet, have you? No, so I haven't. So um, I do, since uh, Natalie had put up the slide about handouts, we do ha have two handouts, one from SRAC okay. on species profile, koi and goldfish, and then the UF 
Edis publication that Jeff Hill and Roy Yunong did, Freshwater Ornamental Fish Commonly Cultured in Florida. And that's really a nice little overview, concise, yes. sweet, and not too long. Right. So I think they're ready, since they're also smelling pizza that was just delivered, I think they're ready to see the videos. All right, let's do the videos. This, this, this will be short. So this is our lab. Um, will, will these just sort of keep cycling as I talk, or should I? How do you want to do it? All right, that's cool. Um, so this is our lab. Our lab is in uh, Ruskin, which is just south of Tampa, where the University of Florida Tropical Aquaculture. And we do research for the people, and our people are those ornamental fish farmers. Um, we have really four areas of, of research. Um, one being general fish reproduction, which is pretty much headed up by Matt DiMaggio. Um, then we also have aquatic animal health, which is Dr. Roy Yanung and Debbie Pooter. Um, we have non-native species research, which is Dr. Jeff Hill and Quentin Tuckett. And then we have just general farm management and extension, which is pretty much headed up by Craig. So what you're looking at here is our, this is what we call our hatchery building. And this just gives you a, a, a look of, of what it might look like inside a farm. I mean, obviously these, the, this building is probably gonna be nicer than what you would encounter, but you know, on the one side you have fish tanks and you have these metal aluminum racks of fish tanks on them and we have different types of species in here. Really not even sure they're doing some sort of a feeding trial. It looks like a black skirt tetra or something's in there. And then that brown thing in the center is a, a lower lethal temperature. Um, some of the species that uh, Quentin and Jeff, those are the non-native guys, what they look at is they want to know is can some of these fish overwinter in Florida? And so they'll, they'll freeze them and see how cold they can stand it. And that tells us, you know, can they make it in Florida? And what, you know, pretty interesting what we did was a, not, not volatan species of lionfish, but another species of lionfish that is in the trade. And we ran it through there. And what we found was it can't live in Florida. So it's, it doesn't tolerate the cold that well. So, and then of course, the last little segment that you see is those burial vaults. There's actually sturgeon in those other tanks that are not burial vaults, but uh, and we have some shiners and some uh, um, dwarf garamias and rosy barbs in there. But you can see, the gel coat on those burial vaults that I was talking about, the ones in the, in the uh, PowerPoint were not gel coated. And that just helps to keep from anything leaching out of the, out of the cement into the water. And um, it just helps us control the, the, the water a little bit better. But, but those are universally used in the industry throughout. And again, it's all because they're cheap and, and, uh, and, and pretty good size kind of see our net there is the shape of a burial vault. So it makes it easy to get the fish out. Okay, you can go on to the next video. All right, here's outside. These are our ponds here. That, that white box, this is really what I want you to see in the, uh, in the PowerPoint. It showed a line drawn across a pond and then off of that line would be air stones drawn into it. Now, th this is another way of mixing it. I mean, th this was made by my predecessor, Carlos. Um, he called them fizzy boxes, but and if you knew Carlos, then you knew that it w we'll find a better name. But anyway, it's for uh, mixing the water and also adding oxygen to it. And some of these are running and some of them are not. But this also gives you an idea of what it looks like. These ponds, they're not big ponds. You got the cinder block there for reference. Uh, in the greenhouse and um, you can see uh, him walking and gives you an idea how big these ponds are. And again, they're about six to eight feet deep and this is pretty typical of what you would encounter on a fish farm. Ours is about 40 ponds, six and a half acres, five greenhouses. Okay, you can go on to the next one. We're next to the weather station. That's what that radar how, is. How deep are the ponds? Six to eight feet deep. Okay, so we have this, another question. Hold on. Okay. Yeah. So we have a good question because you talked about induced spawning. So he's relating that uh -oh. back to clams. Do we consider that clams are induced to spawn? And I would say um, they're stimulated to spawn more than likely because you do not start manipulating the temperatures until you know that they are right. 
So they're stimulated I, I would ag- to release gametes. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, typically when we think about induction is because we're adding that hormone, but with the clams, you just manipulate the temperature. And so I, I don't, yeah. And, and that would be, cause that's what we're circumventing. We're, tr- you know, some sort of environmental cue that we're in the freshwater fish world where the conductivity drops or something like that. Right. And so if, so, if, if so we do have now. two clam guys in here and they're relating this back to clams. So well, the first thing I heard when you said 10,000 fry go into one of those little ponds, I think 10,000 clam seed go into a four foot by four foot bag. That's all I could <laughs> think about. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wish we could do four foot by four foot, 10,000 fish. That'd be great. Then. Sorry. Okay, these are some of the newer species that we're researching. So I, I mentioned earlier when we were talking about fish sources and and where fish come from. Uh, these guys come from Florida, and the industry itself is pretty primarily non-native species. And so I mentioned accountability, and people want to know typically with food, where's my food come from? Uh, But also in the ornamental fish world, they want to know where's my fish come from? And there was kind of a a movement a while ago, started I guess about five years ago, maybe even longer, of these like, I want to grow a native species. Even I had a native Florida fish tank, you know, for a a while. I got over it and I started doing something else. But but these are one of my favorite species. These are black banded sunfish, they are from Florida. We're looking at how to do the reproduction of this fish. And, and like I said before, you can see the different substrates. We have the rocky bottom. We have these plastic pom-poms. They're, they're literally little cheerleader pom-poms. And then we have the, uh, the brush, the, um, the pipe brush. And so we're trying to look at different spawning substrates to see what's going to get these guys to spawn and what's going to be easier to, to handle the eggs. But now I'm talking about, you know, uh, looking at native species and always doing research on and taking cues from our industry Um, and they identified a need where, Hey, people are starting to become interested in some of these native species. And so this is just a small sector of of some of the things that, that we look at. Um, okay. Yeah. And plus it's one of my favorite fish. I like the black bandits. Um, you you could go on to the next video. So this, um, if you've watched, finding dory or finding nemo then this probably looks very familiar to you um and this is obviously a saltwater fish the pacific blue tang this is dory um our claim to fame a few years ago was having been the first laboratory anywhere in the world to have successfully grown this fish in captivity and these are the first offspring that you're looking at um and they're now at reproductive size and so we're trying to get them to start spawning and this is our uh um one of the uh, interns there uh, feeding the fish, which is pretty cool. Um, but anyway, but you, as you can see, uh, they have a little head and lateral line erosion, which is on uh, some of these fish. But uh, and that's just something that we're going to have to work out as far as research is concerned. But otherwise, um, which is a, a unidentified source, but otherwise, in a, a, a healthy fish, and we've actually got spawns from them. We haven't been able to breed those spawns. But what did you say the fish had? Head and lateral line erosion. That's that. So if you look closely between the eyes, you see that white patch. Yeah. And it's really indicative. I mean, the fish is healthy. It's, we think it's either a a nutritional or a, a, from when they were fry or when they were larvae, a nutritional issue, or more likely than not a water quality issue. Um, These are healthy fish. They're, it's not a, a lack of health or it's not a disease per se. Um, it's more of an environmental thing. Uh, but this is also a good point. If these were fish that were being bought and sold for food, it wouldn't matter because the filet is going to look the same and taste the same no matter what. But these are fish that are bought and sold for ornamental purposes. And so that's something that we're going to have to remedy that head and lateral line erosion. And it's something that they saw with the yellow tanks as well. And these are blue tanks. So it, it wasn't odd that we saw it either. So, but this is another um, area of research that we're doing, uh, the marine ornamentals. And like I said, it's a very fast growing sector um, within that ornamental world. And I think that's my last video. I tried to send like six. I, I think I got ambitious in the other what, two. What are you feeding them? So they're being fed mysis. 
um, or a mixture. So we feed them mysis, which is frozen. It's a small little shrimp, and it's dead, and it's frozen, and then we thaw it out, and then we feed it to them. Um, or it's a, an artificial feed that has a mixture of squid. This is all dead stuff, squid and mysis and um, other parts of fish and some uh, macroalgae chopped up and then poured into the water and they just sort of munch on it. We do feed them pellets, a processed pellet from time to time, uh, but we find that the nutritional composition of this sort of frozen, especially the squid, um, is uh, got a good level of fatty acids that's good for them to uh, um, condition, which is ripen with eggs and have good eggs. Okay, so that's the last of the video, I think, right? Yeah, it and, is, yeah. All right, so Pete, Trey, any other questions for Eric? You gonna become a tropical fish farmer? Right, that's what I always ask him too. I guess I get that from you. What? <laughs> What? One. You did do ornaments. You do goldfish and koi. So one of the fellows here come, came to Cedar Key from Arkansas. So yeah. Missouri, excuse me. And you know his grandfather's in the fish business. So you did koi or. Yeah, he did ornamental fish. So he, he knows quite a bit about all this. And then Well that's yeah. cool. That'll help. Yeah. Yeah, you know, koi are pretty interesting. I didn't go into I didn't really go into it. Some of the you know, not everybody follows the ornamental fish mold, but the the koi are interesting because they're a cold water species. And so they can be done all throughout the United States. And there's a lot of of, of the smaller producers throughout the US um because they can tolerate. I mean they can literally live under ice, you know, an ice sheet. Um and you can get quite a bit for a koi that looks good. So you don't have to have a huge farm to make money off of it. So yeah, koi are kind of an anomaly, but, uh, but very indicative of, of, of the trade and a good um, symbol. Anyway, any other questions? No, I think that's it. I appreciate your time and particularly the videos so we could get a little bit more look. Um, of what's going on in operating an ornamental fish farm. Excellent. No, thank you. I enjoy it. And if you guys have any other questions, um, you know, you think of something later on or next week or whatever, Leslie's got my contact info. Uh, reach out to me. I'm more than happy to talk to you. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. Appreciate it. All right. Thanks.